Okay, welcome to the SCR Connections webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Leslie Gelders. Um, she is the Literacy Coordinator at the Oklahoma Department of Libraries. The Oklahoma Department of Libraries is nationally recognized for its support and leadership of statewide literacy efforts. Under the direction of Leslie Gelders, ODL's Literacy Resource Office collaborates with library and community-based literacy programs, state agencies, and other organizations to promote literacy throughout Oklahoma. Since 2012, ODL has placed a major emphasis on health literacy with Gelders' assistance, public libraries, local literacy programs, and more than 100 local partners have, <clears throat> excuse me, have initiated innovative efforts to address Oklahoma's low health ra uh, rankings. What started as a pilot project of five sites has now grown to 31 library and literacy-based health and wellness programs throughout the state. I'm now going to go ahead and pass the ball over to her. Thank you, Brian, and I appreciate uh, National Network of Libraries and Medicine for giving me the opportunity to share some of the exciting activities that are taking place at libraries and literacy programs throughout the state of Oklahoma. And today the plan is for you to pick up some ideas for programs and resources that libraries might offer to promote health and wellness in the community. So let's start with a quick review of one definition of health literacy anyway. It's health literacy is the degree to which an individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. And for me, the keywords are obtain and understand basic health information. So the inability to obtain, communicate, and process or poor health literacy is a stronger predictor of a person's health than their age or their income, employment status, education level, or race. This slide shows some possible challenges to obtaining and understanding health information. If you look at that print information on the left, that was part of a tissue paper thin 15 by 29 inch document that came in a box of medication that I received. And it was full of very small print with little white space and very hard language. And I would say that the information was not really intended to help me obtain or understand the information on that page. It should be noted that while adults with low literacy are likely to struggle with low health literacy, almost all of us have struggled at one time or another with limited understanding of health information. Remember that the definition of health literacy is the capacity to process and understand health information to make appropriate decisions. But when a person is sick or has an emergency health situation or perhaps is helping a family member who is in a health crisis, it's very difficult to understand, much less remember everything those doctors say. So even directions on medications are confusing. If you take a look at the yellow warning on the screen of that medicine bottle, you may not be able to read it, but it says, if you drink alcohol, Discuss the safe use of alcohol while taking this medication with your, with your health care professional. So that's a little confusing. It makes you think you have to take the medication in the presence of your health care professional. Understanding insurance terms such as deductibles and co-payments, pre-authorizations, EOBs, and so on can cause stress to anyone. And sometimes, even following the unfamiliar hospital signs or signs at a medical facility is challenging. And you wonder, why can't things just be easier? Another challenge is understanding often complex medical terminology, so anyone can have trouble with unfamiliar medical terms. You may not know that hypertension means high blood pressure or embolism means blood clot. These terms are hard, hard enough for folks with good literacy skills, but 
they can be very confusing for non-native speakers or individuals with low literacy skills. And personally, I frequently have problems trying to access the online patient portals now widely used by physicians in hospitals. And I would imagine that there are large numbers of individuals who are not able to access their personal information online. And all too often, individuals with low literacy skills are embarrassed or afraid to ask questions. These are just a few examples of challenges individuals have when trying to access and understand complex health and wellness information in order to make informed decisions. And did you know that an estimated 90 million people, or nearly half of the adult population in this country, lack health literacy skills needed to understand and act on health information and the health system demands? In fact, several years ago, it was reported that only 12% of U.S. adults have the necessary health literacy proficiency to perform complex health tasks such as using a table to calculate an employee share of health insurance costs, just 12 percent. Even knowing all these, uh, these statistics, it was very hard for me to believe that Oklahoma was ranked 47th in the country for our health, according to the 2018 report, America's Health Rankings by the United Health Foundation. And there are many reasons for this low health, health ranking, including high rates of diabetes, smoking, obesity, and low rates of physical activity, and even low rates for our consumption of fresh fruit and vegetables. And equally disturbing was that Oklahoma ranked 47th for the health of our seniors and 48th for the health of our women and children. And you can easily find your state health rankings at this site or from a number of other sources, including your own state departments of health. But no matter, no matter where you find the information, it is very clear that there are opportunities for all types of organizations to get involved with health literacy and support the health and wellness of our children, our teens, adults, families, and seniors. Libraries are places that should be and already are involved in health literacy. A 2015 Pew Research study indicated that 36% of individuals aged 16 and older said the library was very important for acquiring health information, and 37% said it was somewhat important. And a study by the Institute of Museum and Library Services reported that over a 12-month period, an estimated 28 million people used library computers or received assistance from librarians for their own health and wellness, including learning about medical conditions, and finding health care providers, and assessing health insurance options. So why libraries? Well, because people are already using libraries as resources for health and wellness. And libraries are trusted community institutions that offer a non-threatening environment, and hopefully today you may gain a little bit better understanding on how libraries can make excellent partners in health literacy and health and wellness efforts. Libraries of all sizes can offer a variety of resources that support health and wellness. We've already mentioned that they offer a non-threatening environment. And just think for a minute of the difference you feel when you walk into a hospital and when you walk into the library. There is a world of difference. The public is welcome to use public access computers and can get assistance finding credible online health information from sites like Medline Plus. Libraries offer uh, health-related programming for children and for adults and for teens, and they can promote health awareness on the library website, 
Facebook pages, blogs, or flyers, uh, library uh, displays, and things like that. And also, libraries often are avail uh, available to offer space for exercise classes, demonstrations, uh, community education, and health-related story times. Libraries are part of a community network, and they have community trust. And libraries have possible access to funds for health and wellness. But perhaps the most important aspect of all is that libraries have librarians who are information experts, and they are willing and able to take the time to help the patrons find health information. And while library staff are often not healthcare professionals, and they do not diagnose medical conditions or suggest specific medical treatments, I believe that libraries are in the unique position to support health literacy and that you really can't find this combination of support and services through any other organization. Since the Oklahoma Department of Libraries became involved with health literacy eight years ago, we have seen firsthand what libraries and literacy programs are doing for Oklahoma communities. And one of the most exciting aspects of Oklahoma's Health Literacy Initiative has been the way it encourages libraries to promote health and wellness through creative and interesting ways and encourages them to partner with non-traditional community organizations. Our state library here in Oklahoma has been fortunate enough to be able to provide grants to libraries in the amounts of $1,500 up to $9,000 with federal funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or IMLS. However, there are many things libraries can do for free or for only minimal cost if you don't have access to those funds. In order to receive a grant from Oklahoma Department of Libraries, our public libraries had to identify what county health uh, issue they were going to address using credible county statistics. And then they had to describe how they would address those issues, what types of programs or what types of resources they would be able to offer. So sometimes pictures really are worth a thousand words. So I want to show you some photos of some of the things going on in Oklahoma both in rural communities and in more urban communities. Now, many of our grantees focus on their county's low rate of physical exercise and high rate of obesity, but staff were sensitive to the fact that many community members did not have access to a gym or were unable to pay for health club memberships. So libraries offered exercise programs free of charge and held at the library. And as you can tell from this picture, this was a yoga class at the Bartlesville Public Library. And last year, the library literacy program, who was the grantee, held 177 classes that dealt with health and wellness with more than 2,400 participants. The swing dance and tango lessons here at the Moore Public Library were very popular and unique ways to get folks up and moving while they had fun. And they had waiting lists for this program that they held last year. They will be providing these this year as well. I'm showing you this class because I want you to see the very small space that was available for this step class at the library in Perkins, Oklahoma. You can see there's just enough space for about maybe 20 people, but from even this angle, you can tell how engaged the participants are in this small community. Okay, this is a picture of a book walk or story walk that is one of six in the state that have been created through library health literacy initiatives. And as you can tell, there, is a, there are signs posted around this park that hold pages from a children's book. The project encourages families to be outdoors, to walk together, to read, and then to visit the library. Most of the 
sites had kickoff events that included a, a variety of community partners, including the, maybe their friends group, their health department, and city officials. And these book, book walks or story walks provided wonderful opportunities for collaboration with city parks departments, local businesses, and health organizations. And one of the sites even featured a night walk where everybody had flashlights and glow sticks, and then they did some stargazing after they walked. Libraries also encouraged children to exercise with programs like this special hula hoop class at the library in Coweta. Other sites included programs on kite flying, juggling, family yoga, and even ballet classes. Libraries seemed to enjoy hosting healthy cooking demonstrations where they collaborated with their local cooperative extension service for a free presenter. This particular workshop was the perfect way to help the community beat the hot Oklahoma summer while encouraging participants to add fresh fruit to their diet. I'm going to go back one slide. Other cooking classes included how to use air fryers, um, how to use Instapot, how to can local produce, and how to prepare heart-healthy meals. And children learned how to cook as well with how to make healthy after-school snacks, how to make salads in a jar, and how to make healthy holiday treats. Last year, uh, we had a librarian that called me and told me that the only grocery store in town had closed and that this meant individuals without transportation to the nearest grocery store, which was now 20 miles away, had to shop at Dollar General Store for their groceries. Now, the community is very thankful that Dollar General Store is available, but, you know, that store can only provide a very limited number of fresh fruits and vegetables and other healthy items. So I want you to think for just a minute about what types of programs a library might offer a community with limited grocery options, also called a food desert, and what are some things the library might do? I, I'd like to just have this be one of these times when you can put some ideas down in the chat box and we can sort of brainstorm some ideas on uh, library involvement in a town with no grocery store. Don't everybody chat at once. <laughs> okay, let's see. Brandy thought a community garden, and that is a great idea. In fact, we have uh, two libraries that have community gardens right next to the library. Oh, this is a great idea, partner with a local food truck. Um, let's see. To partner with a local food truck to provide fresh produce. You could give them tickets to purchase items. Great idea. Create a pathfinder on using online resources for groceries. Excellent. Um, oh, there's a, there's a URL that we can try. Let's see if there's anything else coming up. Cooking using canned foods, very good. Oh, there's a lot of good. Use the bookmobile for a mobile grocery store, I love it. And ask farmers and restaurants for donations. Those are all wonderful ideas. I can tell I'm, I'm talking with a group that knows a little bit about health literacy or maybe a lot. The other things I thought about would maybe be a seed swapping program at the library or uh, this is like the food truck, but arrange for a farmer's market in the library parking lot. Maybe make uh, garden tools available for loans and work with your cooperative extension to host cooking demonstrations on how to prepare healthy meals with available ingredients. Also, a lot of people don't know how to read food labels, so a session on how to select low sodium ingredients or low sugar ingredients, things like that might also be helpful. Some of our sites also provided critical information on things like stroke prevention or resources available for caregivers and seniors. 
these were very popular programs and in, especially in small communities, they were very well attended. Other programs held at this site and at some of the other sites included, uh, let's see, CPR, reducing the risk of falling, eye care, and living with diabetes. Well, does anybody know what's going on here? One of the unique programs focused on Oklahoma's dismal ranking for depression in adults ages 65 and older. So Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library staff researched possible ways to address the issue and learned that a number of clinical trials demonstrated positive outcomes using virtual reality. And this would help these patients or these uh, residents help manage their chronic pain, anxiety, and depression. So the library partnered with Legend Memory Care for a pilot project. The library and Legend staff met to discuss the research and develop a plan for incorporating virtual reality into the bi-monthly library visit to this senior facility. So the first Virtual reality demonstration allowed residents to experience nature scenes wearing these Oculus Go devices. But follow-up visits allow them to take virtual tours of their hometown, visit the Eiffel Tower, and even ride a roller coaster. And the report that they sent back at the end of last year said that the residents were so pleased about this that the Legend Memory Care staff were very pleased about this, and they're continuing to expand this project now, um, now that they tried it for a year. Here's a flyer for a six-week weight, weight loss, I'm sorry, weight loss course taught by an Oklahoma City healthcare system educator at no charge to the host literacy program. The presenter pr provided all the course books, exercise bands, stretch bands, and all kinds of other items to the participants for no charge. Well, our sites have found that hospitals and healthcare systems have been wonderful partners for free presenters and for other resources. Of course, I can't talk about health literacy without mentioning National Network of Libraries of Medicine and their resources. This flyer promoted a program offered by an adult literacy program to help their adult learners and staff learn about Medline Plus and all the helpful resources available at that website. Hopefully, everybody here uh, joining the webinar today is already aware of Medline Plus and this website that's full of credible health information in some 40 languages that include videos and many helpful links. If not, you should add it to your go-to list right away. Also, if you haven't done so, you should also contact your National Network of Library of Medicine regional office or take a look at their website to learn what resources, training, and grants are available to your state. Personally, I'm on a first-name basis with the staff at South Central Region, and we've collaborated with them on several occasions. Well, flu season's almost here, so you might consider the timely topic of flu prevention. Think about ways a library might help the community or maybe even target groups such as children or adults with low reading skills to learn about flu prevention. Let's have this be another place where you can think of an idea and maybe type it in the chat box. We'll pause for a few seconds so you can think about it and add some ideas. No ideas yet, hmm. All right, well, I'll give you some ideas. Oh, with hand washing story time. Excellent. There's a, uh, just to go along with that, there are these things called glow kits. I don't know if anybody's heard of those, but you 
rub this lotion on your hands, and then you hold your hands under a little black light, and it shows, it glows wherever the lotion is. And then you go wash your hands and come back, and it will show you under the black light all the places that you missed, like under your nails and around your knuckles and things like that. And it's very eye-opening. Um, to people who think they wash their hands well. And I actually did this demonstration a while back, and this lady was asking me how I knew that those were actually flu germs. And I had to tell her I, I wasn't really spreading flu germs around the room. I was just doing a demonstration, demonstration using glow germ. Oh, somebody else likes it too, yes. They also have a powder that you can put on your hands and shake people's hands, and they don't realize that you're putting this glow powder on their hands, and then when you hold them under the black light, they're alarmed maybe <laughs> that their hands are glowing. And another part of it, you spray this mist into the air, and it lingers there for up to three minutes. So it sort of demonstrates what a sneeze does, which is maybe kind of gross, but it does get the point across. Uh, let's see some other things here. Um, partnered with a local health department to provide space for flu shots, excellent. Hand washing story time, cover your cough and sneeze story time, story time I love it. Um, flyer on where to get the free flu shot, glow germ is amazing, yes. I have some other ideas too that I'd like to share. Um, you could arrange for a pharmacist or doctor to come to the library and talk about the flu and sort of have an ask the doctor uh, time at the library. You can install maybe some antibacterial soap dispensers in the library. In addition to offering those children's programs on sneezing, you might use the books Germs Make Me Sick or Germs, Germs, Germs or some book like that. You maybe could get Walmart or some other organization to donate the books so each child could take one home. You could teach a computer class uh, on how to access credible flu information from Medline Plus. Uh, you might show patrons how to find information and videos on the flu from the Mayo Clinic patient information site or purchase down or download easy to read brochures and print information on flu prevention. I would just hope that you would make sure it's written with plain language, not like that document I showed you at the beginning, Plain language with meaning larger font and white space and maybe some photographs or graphics. You might use teaching materials about the flu that are also written in plain language. And I'm going to show you where to get those in a little bit. And I also said the glow, glow germ or similar demonstration. If you're interested in glow germ, it's spelled G-L-O, glow germ. So let's talk for a bit about why libraries should be involved in health literacy or even more involved in these types of programs. So involvement in health literacy and health and wellness helps advance the library's role as a community anchor and shows the community that the library is responding to community needs. It also helps the community, including businesses, and other organizations recognize the library's expertise as an information resource. Of course, adding programs will increase the numbers of library participants, and that these types of programs can result in greater use of the library computers and other materials. It helps the library promote an educated and informed citizenry and develop new and non-traditional community partners. And many of these partners are actually searching for partners as well, and they're very thrilled to work with the library, and many times never even thought about involving the library in these types of efforts. Well, finding community partners is easy, and we have an amazing number and diversity of organizations. When I wrote the little bio, we had 100 partners, I think Brian mentioned, but actually now at, at the end of this past year, we have two, more than 250 partners. And this is just a partial list. You can see that it includes dentists and pharmacists, schools, food pantries, master gardeners, tribal programs, veteran centers, and civic organizations. Several libraries even reported that they used to have to go out and find community partners, but that now community partners are contacting them and asking to get involved. 
Collaborations to these types of programs really are the key, and here are our champions. We can thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for providing the funding that has helped us provide grants to local libraries to launch and to expand their efforts. We can thank the National Network of Libraries of Medicine for their partnership project, all the online courses, and their grant opportunities, a cooperative extension service that offers a lot of free educators on everything from cooking demonstrations to Tai Chi, and a healthy aging initiatives, which also offer many good educators. However, there is a cost for those services. I first got interested in health literacy thanks to encouragement from literacy colleagues in Wisconsin and in Florida. And both of these states have some wonderful and free health literacy resources, including curriculum. If you look on the left, you'll see at the bottom there a, a green, uh, green color and on the book called The Flu. This was written with plain language, which makes it excellent for library literacy programs or for use with populations with low reading skills. And you can download that book for free. You can also look on the right and see that the Florida Literacy Coalition has some publications that are also downloadable or very reasonably priced if you want a hard copy called Staying Healthy. And they also have uh, books on uh, women's health and books intended for non-native speakers. So you can Google uh, Health Literacy Wisconsin or Health Literacy Florida to find this information, or you can email me and I will put you in touch with uh, my colleagues in those states. You might also check out free patient education material from the American College of Physicians. They have a lot of downloadable information on specific health issues that are available in English and Spanish. And I've, I've found that there are more and more very good resources for free and credible health information, as well as publishers who are selling health information in easy to read format. There are libraries all across the country that are offering wonderful health literacy programs. So there are many, many ways to find ideas that can suit your budget, your staff, your location, your interest, and your time. You could check out Web Junction for information about library engagement in health literacy. And you might check out Let's Move in Library, which is an initiative that supports healthy communities by sharing the impact of public libraries as they promote health and wellness. And Let's Move in Libraries is a project administered by the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. You might search for that and request to receive their monthly newsletter, which is full of ideas from around the country. Well, whew, it's been a whirlwind today of health literacy in Oklahoma. Um, it has been a pleasure sharing some of these things with you, and I hope that you gained some information. I wanted to leave room for questions and even some time for you to share some of your ideas uh, and some of the things that you're doing in your state. I hope that you gain some inspiration on ways to promote health and wellness at the library. And if you're joining us and are not from a library, I hope you think about uh, collaborating and communicating with your local library to address this important issue. Uh, I hope you're feel free to contact me, and I can put you into contact with any of our 30 sites that are doing these wonderful things across Oklahoma. So with that, I will uh, invite Brian to come back on and help me find and answer any questions you might have. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. I know as an office we love working with you and seeing all the great work that you're doing in Oklahoma. Um, and yes, we'd absolutely like to take any questions that you might have for Leslie. Uh, 
Will the, Brian, it says, will the presentation be sent out? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, I, you know, we we have the link, so I'm going to go ahead and paste the link into the – oh, my colleague Debbie already did. So uh, you can Ooh, download okay. that there. And if you have any uh, – if you missed that or – or just lost it later, you can always email us at our email. Do I coordinate with libraries at the county level or statewide? Any library, public library in the state of Oklahoma is uh, welcome to apply for one of our grants. And so I coordinate with uh, systems, with uh, independent libraries and with uh, nonprofit literacy programs across the state. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, um, it, it says infusing health literacy into English as a second language and adult literacy classes is an effective way to improve health literacy, and that is very true. All, all of our adult literacy programs that got a grant must not only offer resources to their community, but also to their adult learner. So they're doing just that. They're maybe taking a tour of the hospital with a interpreter. Or they take their ESL class to the hospital and have an interpreter. They practice dialing 911 and practice um, that sort of thing. Uh, they offer exercise and classes just for the adult learners. They also have adult learner book clubs that are using health topics as the curriculum for that. So um, do I have any partnerships with hospital systems? We don't at the state level, but the local uh, grantees have partnered with hospitals. And uh, in Oklahoma City, the ho hospital system is the one that did that six-week course for the community, so they partner at the local level. Oh, thank you very much. We have a lot of our flyers from our different programs on our website, and it's a great place to go and just get some ideas. I, I wasn't able to share all the ideas. You know, we have 30 sites this year, and um, they are all doing different things. They collaborate with each other. We have a closed Facebook site so they can show pictures and communicate and ask each other questions. So you can visit the Oklahoma Department of Libraries and find that information. Um, Carolyn says, where would I find the ESL ideas? Carolyn, if you would uh, email me or call me, I'll put you in touch with those programs that are doing that and you can talk to them directly. So there's my email. And anybody else, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me or call me. I have a toll-free number, which I'll give right now. It's 1-800-522-8116. You'll have to go through the switchboard, though, to get to the literacy office. Well, I'll give you my direct line, too. It's 405-522-3242. I think it's on the beginning of this. There it is. Thank you, Brian. Well, I enjoyed sharing with you today, and I, I would love to hear from you and hear any ideas that you're doing that I could share with our sites in Oklahoma. So I'll be on the here a little bit, but if you have to leave, I just wanted to thank you so much for spending this time with me. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. I just want to ask. I, you know, it, it sounds like you're you're doing so much. What's on the what's on the horizon over the next couple of years for you, Leslie? Well, that is a very good question. A, a lot of the sites uh, start small. We that we have we had nine new sites this year. This year they have to start with a smaller grant. And then as they get their feet wet and, and kind of figure out what, what health literacy means, because the term health literacy is to, you know, to many rural librarians uh, and literacy programs in our state sounds sort of intimidating. But once they see that some of these projects, they see that they can actually do it. So they start small, and I'm hoping that a lot of those sites will then increase in 
their grants and increase in their projects and increase in their community partners. A lot of times the, the community partners want to donate money and donate their time so that it's, it's not really a, a, a real expensive project to um, provide health literacy services for the community. So I would like to see that expand more. I would love to have a place where uh, different states can network as well, and I, they're probably, you know, through Web Junction and through that University of North Carolina uh, project, I think we could do that, but if we would just um, share ideas, I would love to learn from others. And uh, with, also with the literacy colleagues, so the library colleagues and the literacy colleagues working together would be a, a, great, uh, a great thing. Great, thank you. And of course, yeah, we'd love to figure out how uh, along the journey we can support you in the future too. So uh, thank you again. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you, you're welcome.